so I hope you enjoyed the waffles. I certainly did. Um, so now uh, for the next talk, it will be Sean Conheedy from uh, First Defense Information Security, and she will talk about social engineering for penetration testers. So please, a round of applause for Sean Conheedy. Thank you. Hi everyone, and first thing I'd like to point out is I didn't know there was waffles outside, so I'll try and keep this talk quite short because I didn't get any, so uh, short enough so I can go out and get some. Uh, but welcome to, I think, what is possibly the retroist talk. Uh, of the Retro Talk Day. So I first gave this talk at the very first BrewCon in 2009. Um, and I can't believe I'm back giving pretty much the same talk again almost 10 years later. And you know what? Social engineering has changed so little that I am in a position where I can give the same talk again. Um, who here does social engineering for a living? Okay. And who's seen me present before? Right, okay, I just want to talk, about, I just want to see what war stories I can or cannot reuse, okay. So, 10 years of social engineering, back in 2009, I guess I was working primarily as a pen tester with a bit of social engineering. These days, I'm pretty much exclusively doing social engineering, and that's just an indication of how popular it's become in the last decade. It's just been incredible. And I have done, oh my goodness, I've played all kinds of roles from graduate through to CEO. Um, I have gone in as a, a pregnant lady with a baby on board badge. Everyone's held the doors open for me in organizations I've tried to get in. That's really effective. Uh, I have gone in as a blood donor, which shows how much I care about social engineering that I have been willing to give blood for my career. And I don't know how many of you can say that. Uh, one of my favorite social engineers has been when a client approached me and asked me to go to the pub on a Friday night to listen to what their uh, employees were saying about what's going on in the office. And that was one of my favorite social engineers because basically I had to chat to the employees a little bit, but the client had to pay for my drinks all night. And I'm Irish. In a pub on Friday night, you can only imagine what that cost them. Uh, that was great. I really enjoyed that. But the same client came back to me and they said, uh, our employees all go to the same sports club and they hang around in the jacuzzi a lot. So we would like you to go hang around in the jacuzzi and listen to what they're saying about work. And because my reports are full of photos, I had to say no to that one. They just weren't willing to pay quite enough. But you know, honestly, look at, look at me. I do not look like I belong at a conference like this, do I? No. Um, and I am fully aware of that. And I have built a career out of confounding expectations, taking expectations and stereotypes and turning them on their head. And it's been really good fun. Working in social engineering is fun. It's also very tiring. And um, in 10 years, I've come to consider the ethics of social engineering quite a lot. So there are things that I will not do now that I might have done 10 years ago. Um, all kinds of things. So, you know, I've spent 10 years basically hanging around, looking suspicious, hanging around offices. Because although I do a lot of fishing, and most social engineering these days uh, for a tester is fishing, it's the physical social engineering that I still love and I crave, I really enjoy. Uh, so I spent 10 years hanging around offices looking really suspicious. I spent, you know, a lot of time hanging around with smokers. Um, had to cut that out because I'm asthmatic. I just couldn't hang around with them anymore. Um, I've spent a lot of time hanging around stairwells, hours upon hours, hanging around the loos of various organizations. Um, and I guess I'll, I'll I'll um, scatter some various tips throughout this talk. So over, just last month, uh, I was doing a social engineering test in the UK, and we had a scorcher of a summer, as I'm sure you did here in Belgium. So the first thing I do when I get into an organization is I like to try and find out where the toilets are. Number one, it gives me a sense of purpose. When I get into an organization, I kind of have something to aim for. But number two, it gives me somewhere to hide. So I guess things I've learned from hiding in toilets for 10 years. Uh, Always bring water with you. It gets really hot. Sometimes they're not air conditioned. Uh, every time you hear somebody else come into the toilet, change cubicles. 
or change toilets altogether because he can't hang out in the same loo for two or three hours. That looks really suspicious. <laughs> Number three, uh, bring some kind of e-book reader with you. Uh, make sure it's fully charged because you will fly through the books. It's really boring sitting on a toilet for that long. <laughs> you can only actually go to the toilet so many times. <laughs> Also, that harks back to drinking a lot of water to make it realistic. Anyhow. <laughs> so back in 2009, you know, I think I had some alternative names for this talk. What I would change from that talk is I said, if you can't go through the firewall, go through the secretary. I don't tend to target secretaries anymore because they're actually some of the best people at defending against social engineering. Uh, I'm sure a lot of you will agree with me there. Secretaries, you know, they, they will not let anyone near the people that they're working for, whether it's recruitment agents or indeed social engineers. So I try to go, uh, I try to target other people in the organization and use secretaries or PAs as a last resort. But I guess what you could call this talk in 2018 is just basically, yes, social engineering still works. So in 2009, you know, you still had to kind of explain to people a little bit what social engineering was. And now your average man on the street knows what phishing is, for better or for worse. Uh, so just to give it a little uh, update now, social engineering uh, refers to efforts to influence popular attitudes, whether by governments or private groups. And oh boy, we hadn't seen nothing yet in 2009, but we have seen this in a big, big way since then. So, you know, back when we were thinking about how governments influence popular behavior and attitudes back in 2009, you know, wow, this seems like an eternity ago, doesn't it? Uh, so, you know, Second World War propaganda, any kind of propaganda for votes and stuff, and we hadn't seen nothing yet. So, uh, phishing emails, social engineering emails in 2009, were kind of fun. They had really imaginative email subjects. They were really fun. So these are some example subjects from the Storm botnet, which seems almost quaint now when you think back on it. Uh, Bush down to eight friends on MySpace. Wow, MySpace was still there. Uh, you know, really, really fun stuff. It was also the era of swine flu. So there was a lot of malware that spread via these uh, first US swine flu victims kind of emails. That was fun. The most common email subject lines for phishing attacks in 2018 are a lot duller. They are certainly a lot more believable, but a lot less imaginative. So uh, Mitnick's definition of social engineering still applies. Techniques hackers use to deceive a trusted computer user within a company into revealing sensitive information or trick an unsuspecting mark into performing actions that create a security hole for them to slip through. So it's basically trying to get people to do things they wouldn't really otherwise do uh, or take advantage of security holes that you see. For example, if you see a door that's open that shouldn't be open, sure, you slip in through it and that, that counts as social engineering as well. So what's changed since 2009? Nothing. What does this say about our industry? Social engineering is still as effective, if not more effective, than ever before. So I think as security professionals, something isn't working for us. You know, there should be better controls and better defenses that stop social engineering from working. But in most cases, I'm still getting in, just as I did in 2009. And largely, it's down to human nature. And what has changed in the last 10 years in human nature that would stop social engineering from working? So social engineers and fraudsters have been around pretty much for as long as humankind has been around. If you look at one example of advanced fee fraud, it actually dates from the, six, uh, the 16th century and the time of the Spanish Armada. So one, one of the first documented uh, advanced fee fraud attacks we saw was when a con man would approach a British nobleman, a very wealthy person, with a beautiful lady on his arm, and he would say, this beautiful Spanish lady's father has been imprisoned in Spain, and you need to give me some money to help release this guy who will reward you not only financially, but will also allow you to marry his most beautiful daughter. And it was very effective. Um, then the next documented 
advance fee fraud, I suppose, if you'd like to call it that, was the letter from Jerusalem. And this guy, uh, Eugène Francois Vidoc, anybody know who he is? He set up the French police, and he was a bit of a scoundrel himself. Uh, he was an army deserter, he was in and out of prison, and he wrote his memoirs, they're a fascinating read to this day. And he discussed uh, a social engineering attack called the Letter from Jerusalem. So basically, when a new prisoner would arrive in prison, Eugène Francois Vidoc and his colleagues would ask them for a list of anybody wealthy that they knew, and then they would send these letters, the letters from Jerusalem, to the wealthy individuals trying to trick them into uh, handing over large amounts of money. And he had fantastic success rates. And he claims of 100 letters, 20 were always answered, which for a phishing test is pretty good. They were so successful and so convincing that sometimes even the Parisians would fall for these scams. So that's really saying something. So skipping on a few centuries, he had the Nigerian scams in the 1980s when the Nigerian oil-based economy declined. And some enterprising university students uh, devised this scam to manipulate visitors to Nigeria into some shady oil deals and you know they originally they started targeting people in Nigeria then it spread internationally via letter, fax, telex and eventually email. Uh, fast forward a bit you've got our classic 419 scam and this is probably one of my favorite ones ever. This Nigerian astronaut has been stuck up in space since 1989 and luckily there's been some shuttles that have provided him with food etc because otherwise he'd be in real trouble but he's been stuck up there what 30 years now and he really wants to come back uh, and you wonder who falls for this kind of thing you know but there is a theory that says for people who fall for this kind of thing are ripe for social engineering scams. So, so they suspect maybe people send out these really quite ridiculous scams uh, to find out who their targets should be for more believable scams. But it's not always the really sophisticated scams that work. I was reading lately, you know, even the simplest Microsoft call scam where they ring you up and say, hi, this is Microsoft, you have a problem on your computer. They are actually on the rise. I can't believe it in 2018 that these calls are on the rise and are as successful as ever. So the 419 scams kind of morphed into the friend scams, uh, where the attacks came in from your friends, IRV email, social media, instant messaging, etc. So we see different flavors of these, for example, the stranded traveler. I'm stranded in uh, Ghent, for example. You might get one from me over the course of this week saying, I'm stranded in Ghent. I lost my wallet. Uh, please, can you help me pay for my hotel? Uh, the mugging victim was common for a while, especially on trips to London. I've got to tell you, since Brexit, you know, hard times in London. I live there myself. So people would receive these scams saying, I've been mugged, uh, lost my wallet. You need to send me some money. I did a pretty cool friend scam last year as part of a phishing test and the goal of the test was to target the 12 or so individuals that made up the board of directors. Uh, I got 11 of them through pretty standard means and the 12th guy had nothing about him online. It was really hard. He didn't have any kind of social networking, um, just had no online presence and you kind of got the impression from looking at him that maybe it's not that he was security aware, it's just that he was kind of old and not really bothered with social networking, basically. Um, so he was really stuck on how to target this guy. You could tell he hardly even read emails, because I'd sent a few and I hadn't got anything back. Uh, and eventually I found a picture. Last year was 2017. So I found a picture from 2007 that some photographer had posted on his website. And that picture was of this guy's class reunion in 2007. It was the 30 year class reunion. And obviously it was 10 years previous. So I had to try and check if it was the same guy. He looked kind of the same, you know, a bit, a bit heavier, a bit older, but I was fairly confident it was the same guy. So 
from the class photos, he could tell the names of other people in his class, uh, the name of the school he went to. So it was pretty easy on the back of that information that this guy hadn't even been published about himself to devise a phishing email from one of his classmates that said, hey, can't believe it's 10 years since the last reunion. It's time for our 40th school reunion. Please register here. Click on the link. And of course he did. Uh, so it's amazing what you can do with friend scams. This year, well, for the last few years, we've seen a lot of these things come in via WhatsApp fake vouchers, for example. Uh, earlier this year, there was a free Heineken one that was very successful because free beer. So what actually has changed since 2009? I would say the main thing is just the scale of social engineering that we see these days. Uh, you know, you can pretty much assume for each compromise we read about that there has been an aspect of social engineering. It's absolutely unprecedented. Uh, the social engineering attacks we see are sometimes, not always, but sometimes more sophisticated more targeted, and from an ethical social engineer's point of view, they're mostly phishing attacks, which aren't as much fun as the physical ones, but you know, you still get some satisfaction out of them. So why does social engineering work? And this is exactly the same as 2009. People want to help. It's amazing. I mean, I walked out of one organization actually holding, I'm going to pretend it was servers, but it was actually just one server because they're quite heavy. I walked out holding a server and people held the door back for me. I plugged it but back in the days when I used to take my laptop with me. I don't tend to so much anymore. I would plug in my laptop and people would bring me over a chair to sit on. I mean, people are so helpful. Uh, it's a customer service focused society. You know, call center agents want to help you, receptionists want to help you, people just want to help, and it makes them feel good. It makes me feel good too when they let me in. Um, social engineering works because of. I would say people are greedy. It's not so much that they're greedy, more that if they can get something out of it, whether it's that sense of satisfaction from helping someone or a bar of chocolate or the chance to win something or other, they're far more likely to comply with your request. Uh, I guess a decade ago, InfoSec used to do a survey where they would swap passwords for chocolate bars. I don't think they do that anymore. Uh, and I suppose it's less likely to be successful. But you'd be amazed how often, if you ask someone for their password, they'd tell you because they can't think of a different answer quick enough. Um, as human beings, we have a tendency to trust other human beings. And indeed, why wouldn't we? In 99.9% .9 of cases, they are who they say they are. But you know, we even have a hormone, oxytocin, that's called the trust hormone. So we are made to trust other people. Uh, and obviously, social engineers take advantage of that. There was an experiment. I can't in the 50s or 60s, I think, the Milgram experiment, which I referred to in 2009, where volunteers uh, were split into two groups, and one set of volunteers, well, they, they were paired up, and person A was told that person B was being attached to some um, electric shock ma machine, but there was a guy in a white coat there, and he would say, turn up the voltage, turn up the voltage. Uh, each time they were asked to administer an electric shock, turn up the voltage. And nearly everyone turned up the voltage so high that it would have killed the other person. Uh, uh, but the guy, you know, there was someone in a white coat, so why wouldn't you believe them? Social engineering works because people are complacent. Sometimes it's easier to give people information to get rid of them, you know, rather than having to actually <laughs> confront them. Ooh. People hate confronting you when you're a social engineer. Um, I have sat in offices, I've sat in offices with just like five or six people in there, and people haven't confronted me. I have uh, occasionally played the role of an auditor, and people just give you information then because they want to get rid of you. No one's keen on an auditor, so they just give you information and want to get rid of you. And of course, people are afraid of getting into trouble for not doing their job, especially if you're playing a position of somebody in power. People just want to comply and give in to you. 
So in 2009, I decided that there were three categories of social engineering, remote social engineering, on-site social engineering, and what are called next generation social engineering. So remote social engineering via email, telephone, and indeed fax machine. It's a long time since I've done a social engineer using a fax machine, but I expect it probably still works. And in fact, I was dealing with an organization the other day who insisted on having a fax sent through. And this day and age, it's actually sometimes kind of difficult to find a fax machine in the first place. But certainly remote social engineering via email and telephone is still rife. On-site physical social engineering, again, is still quite popular. It's very effective, but it's obviously easier to get caught. And then I had uh, the next generation or real world attacks so the example I gave back then was the traffic ticket incident where uh, cars parked in a car park got parking tickets on them. When the owners got back to their cars, they found this parking ticket and the parking ticket asked them to visit a link to pay the fine. When they visited the link, they had to find the picture of their car, click on it, and you can imagine what happened then. I'm really surprised that we haven't seen more incidents like this, where it's a bit of a combination of real world stuff with um, technical stuff. And I think, you know, these are really successful attacks. Maybe we'll see more of them because they're really, really successful. So there are loads of different types of social engineering attacks. To give some examples, there is the mumble attack. And the mumble attack was popular around 2009. Uh, a little while previous to my talk, Verizon had been targeted by fraudsters who used the mumble attack. And what they did was uh, they called up Verizon on behalf of a customer who was speech impaired. And if the call center agent asked to speak directly to the customer, they impersonated a speech impaired customer on the line. And of course, this kind of embarrassed the call center agent, uh, who then disclosed information they shouldn't have disclosed. I guess I have used mumble attacks in a slightly different way. Uh, I'm Irish and I speak quite quickly. So I've done several attacks in foreign countries where I've purposely spoken so quickly that people don't know what I'm saying. They can't follow it. And there's only so many times people can say, excuse me, what did you say? Excuse me? Before they're just embarrassed and they're like, just, just, just go in. It's quite successful. Uh, in 2009, I spoke about reverse social engineering. So that is when you present a solution and then you create a problem for which you are the solution. For example, it might be that you advertise as pest control near an organization and then you release a plague of cockroaches or something into the organization and they think, oh yeah, actually, yeah, yeah, I, I saw someone advertise and I'll call them up. To be honest, that's really complicated. The most successful social engineers are a lot simpler. I mean, I've got into so many organizations carrying cups of coffee. I've carried thousands of cups of coffee into organizations so that people will open the doors and allow me to tailgate. And that works better than a really complicated reverse social engineer. Uh, in 2007 and periodically since, road apples have been very successful and they're a little bit like the traffic ticket uh, example from a couple of slides ago. So road apples are typically USB keys or some kind of media that are scattered uh, around or in an organization that you hope people are going to plug in uh, and the device will call home or uh, it depends in the case of a ethical social engineering test, they might just ask you to visit a certain website or allow the, or allow the tester to know they have been plugged in. These were pretty popular and I still get asked to do them a lot. But they're, from an ethical social engineering point of view, they're actually really, really tricky. Because number one, if you scatter them outside of an organization in a car park, for example, how do you know who's going to pick them up? Is it going to be employees who are working for your target organization? If it's not, then you're in trouble. Um, if you scatter them inside a building and it's a shared building, again, how do you know it's just going to be people from the organization you're targeting who pick them up and not from a different occupant within the building? Uh, and finally, even if someone from your target organization does pick them up, how do you know they're going to plug them in 
to a work device and not a personal device. If they plug them into a personal device and it does anything malicious, you're in trouble. So I've actually stopped doing road apples because I find them far too complicated uh, and unpredictable. Ten attacks are fun. You mostly see, well, ten attacks are pretty much distraction attacks. The ten attack in particular is when you use a good looking person to distract security while their less good looking counterparts uh, sneak in unnoticed. And typically you see it in the movies. So, you know, back in 2009 I said it looked a bit like this. But I figured if you had a ten attack, there must also be a minus ten attack where the less good looking counterpart distracts security and the good looking one sneaks in unnoticed. <laughs> um, so when I set this up prior to BrewCon 2009, quite some time ago, uh, I remember having a conversation with the security guard saying, I'm presenting at a conference, I'm talking about social engineering and I need to take some photos, do you mind? And they're like, no, no, go ahead, take your photos. And I said, do you know what social engineering is? Nope. I mean, I hope now that security guards do know what social engineering is, but I wouldn't count on it. But I spent about 20 minutes distracting the security guard while we took all these photos. And during this 20 minutes, I reckon anyone could have sneaked in unnoticed. So I call this the 10 squared attack. So back in 2009, wow, phishing was kind of new, smishing and vision were kind of new, but again, you could see that all these different types of attacks were split into remote versus on-site versus real world. And in 2009, I had to try and convince people that social engineering was a problem, mostly so that I could do social engineering tests and they would believe me. So it was harder then to find examples of social engineering in the press. I mean, I could put together 50 slides probably on social engineering attacks that have been reported even just this week now, but back then it was a bit trickier. One of my favorite examples then was this guy, uh, let's see, does this, okay. Boy tries to talk, to talk his way onto the plane again. This, this young boy in America, uh, decided he'd run away from home. He was only nine or 10, really smart. Well, certainly a, a, a smart talker, I suppose. So one day he stole a vehicle and drove it down the motorway and he was caught because he was going at something ridiculous like 90 miles an hour and he was caught. He learned to drive from playing video games. So you gotta hand it to him. Uh, so he was caught and brought back home again. But the next day he decided he would try again. This young boy, Semaj Booker. And he thought, I'll, I'll aim bigger this time. I won't do cars. He went to the airport and he heard the gates closing. So he ran up to the uh, security at the gates and he said, that's my flight. My parents are already on the flight. And at the time, kids didn't need any kind of ID. So they let him on the flight and he flew from California uh, to Texas with a stopover in Phoenix before he was caught. So I remember being really impressed with this guy. And the most fun I've had uh, updating this talk is seeing what happened to all these, you know, potential social engineers that I spoke about back then. And this guy has a fascinating history. He's been on Oprah or Ellen or some of those daytime talk shows. He was in and out of uh, foster homes. He's a kid of, of his own now. Um, and he's now a national basketball player in America. So fair play, land of, the, land of opportunity. Oh yeah. This guy, anyone recognize him? This, this guy was big news in the first BrewCon. I, I'm pretty sure he wasn't at the first BrewCon, but we spoke about him quite extensively. His name was Carlos Hector Flomenbaum, and he had robbed a, a diamond vault just down the road in Antwerp, uh, maybe a year or two before the first BrewCon. And the way he did it, was by befriending the staff in the bank. He was very charming. He brought the staff in flowers, boxes of chocolate, chocolates, and he was all around a very charming guy. Somehow convinced the staff to give him a key card that gave him 24 seven access to the diamond vaults. And one evening cleared off with something like 30 or 40 million euros worth of diamonds. He was super successful. Carlos Hector Flomenbaum. So I was wondering, what happened to this guy? Um, 
the Carlos Hector Flomenbaum passport had been reported as stolen a couple of years previous in Israel, so he stole this guy's identity. Um, I'm just saying, you know, if you're going to steal an identity where the initial spelled CHF might give you a clue, Switzerland maybe, but actually I just looked him up on LinkedIn and I found him, so if there's any police or law enforcement here, Carlos Hector Flamenbaum is uh, in Argentina right now, so go get him, I want to hear his story. <laughs> but actually, you know what, that diamond heist was small fry compared to what we've seen since. Oh, diamond heists are really, really fascinating. So I've just picked, you know, a handful of examples from the past decade. And what's interesting about them um, is that they almost always include some kind of costume, dressing up, just like I do in social engineering tests, you know, whether it's dressing up as a KLM staff if you're going to target an airport, uh, men dressed as women randomly. Um, in London, the Crooks visited a professional makeup artist to change their entire appearance, and that was amazing. I think the professional makeup artist had to go into protective custody after that. Um, one of the more interesting ones was the Damiani showroom, the second last one, the Damiani showroom in Milan, where uh, the lady who lived next door to this showroom rang the police every day for a month beforehand to complain about the drilling that she heard. And the police just dismissed her because there was so much drilling going on in Milan at the time that they just thought, oh yeah, whatever, this is just another crazy lady calling in. Um, and funnily enough, the crooks actually drilled their way into the showroom, so she was absolutely right in reporting them. In social engineering, we would call this a boy who cried wolf attack, where you know your usual uh, guards are just down because you've heard the same complaint so many times. The crooks only got away with 20 million pounds worth of diamonds, and anyone know why that was? It was Oscar season. So all the really expensive pieces were on loan to the stars for the Oscars. Uh, then the final one, Brussels Airport, $50 million, quite a good return. The thieves wore police uniforms, and this is something I've learned in social engineering as well, that you have to be really careful in an ethical test about who you are going to pretend to be, and you absolutely cannot pretend to be law enforcement. Um, so I wrote a, a book about social engineering a few years ago, and I thought, wait a minute, you can't pretend to be law enforcement. What about strippers? The, oh, strippers are always dressing as policemen. But actually, that's illegal. <laughs> so this guy, a Scottish fella, this stripper has been arrested 22 times for impersonating police officers. Imagine that. <laughs> So one of my favourite diamond heists um, of the last few years was a diamond heist in London, where I live. They've just made a movie of it, I haven't seen it yet, I'm really looking forward to seeing it, uh, called The King of Thieves. And these um, crooks targeted uh, diamond vaults in Hatton Gardens, where Londoners keep their diamonds. And what was interesting about this was the crooks, all but one, were in their 60s and 70s. And it was just like something, you know, a classic vintage movie uh, from years back. And the police even said these guys were analog crooks operating in a digital age. And they reckon there won't be any more diamond heists like this. These guys... Um, access that they, again, they drilled in over a bank holiday weekend, which was pretty smart because uh, it wasn't actually picked up till Tuesday when everyone went back to work. So they got away, they got away with an awful lot. But there are a few funny aspects. Um, in the UK, you get free travel when you're 65. In London, you get a freedom pass. So a few of these guys use their freedom passes to get to the heist. <laughs> <laughs> their lookout guy kept falling asleep. <laughs> And it was just, it, it was really interesting, and I reckon that'll be a good movie. Um, they were caught because they used to gather in this pub, pro proper London, you know, they used to gather in a pub and they started bragging about it in the pub. So the police sent down a lip reader and uh, they were able to uh, apprehend these crooks. God knows what's happened then. But actually, most of the time, uh, diamond thieves do not get caught. 
So social engineering is obviously a problem and it's a really good idea to perform a social engineering test to test the effectiveness of physical security controls, to test the level of and improve security awareness among staff and you know to give your staff practice at identifying the kinds of techniques that malicious social engineers use. The stages of the attack are by and large, the, well, they're exactly the same as they were in 2009, from target identification through to the writing the report. So before you start, as in 2009, you need to get your get out of jail free card. Uh, and this is a letter of indemnity, just in case you're caught, you can show it to people uh, to explain what you've been doing there. So it should include details like a very simple explanation of what you're doing, the names of people within your target organisation who have commissioned the test, uh, and contact numbers for them. And I've learned over my last 10 years to always include the name of at least two people within the organisation who commissioned the test, because once I did a test, had to hand over my letter, and the guy who commissioned the test was on holidays. <laughs> and very hard to get hold of, and that took a little while to get out of. Oh yeah, so an update since 2009 is uh, reconnaissance is now called OSINT, but still pretty much the same thing. So uh, once you've decided who you're going to target, uh, got all your contract work out of the way, which, oh, the contracts are much longer now as well. Um, then you're going to do your passive information gathering, so gathering as much information as you can about your target organisation in the time you have allowed. And I thought there was a lot of information available about people and organisations in 2009. Oh, there's so much more information available now. So uh, most of my pretexts or the scenarios that I use these days come from social networking sites and not necessarily social networking sites of employees because that can be a bit of a grey area but the social networking sites of organisations themselves. Oh they've been a treasure trove of information. So um, I've done different social engineers like one client congratulated an employee who had just had a baby. So I spoofed an email from, supposedly from her partner saying, here's the picture, the mo mother and baby are doing well, here's the picture attached if you want to see. Loads of people clicked on that because it was, you know, soft and cuddly and things. Um, I found one organization who put on their social network and site that they were having a, a blood donor drive the next day, so I arrived to give blood. <laughs> uh, got me into the organization. Organisations are always uh, gloating about the kind of charity work they do, for example, whether it's collecting shoes to going on fun runs. The fun runs are always brilliant because I like to send in uh, a summary of who's come where. It's usually an accompanying Excel spreadsheet or something like that, or certificates of completion for having entered the race. People love clicking on them. So yeah, the social network sites are great. Um, one thing that has changed are the who, who is records, basically because of GDPR, they're not as useful as they used to be. Uh, I remember going into one organization in Italy, and again, it was a kind of mumble attack. I knew they had offices in America as well, so I arrived at the uh, Italy office at, at 8 a.m. in the morning, which was, what, midnight in America or something, or wherever the other offices were. And I said, yeah, I've got a meeting with the name of the guy from the Who Is Records. They were like, well, we, we've no record of this. And I said, well, you know, ring my, ring my office to find out. Of course, at midnight, no one's answering. And I just kept speaking at them, speaking at them, and they got more and more flustered until they said, OK, can you just go through and wait in this meeting room until we sort this out? Well, all I needed was a meeting room, so that was fine. Managed to connect to the network from in there. So in terms of physical reconnaissance, if you're going to try to get physical access to the building, you need to go along and case the joint. Uh, you know, hang around suspiciously outside it, or even better, find a coffee shop or someplace nearby where it's warm, and you can look uh, at the organization you're trying to target. Uh, look for things like where the security guards are congregated. Are there any unusual ways in? Fire escapes, garages. I have walked in through loads of fire escapes, you know, no, not loads of fire escapes, because you never know if it's going to set off a fire alarm, but a lot of the time they're propped open, whether it's for air, condi 
air flow to come through or smokers to go outside, then I have got through fire escapes. I've walked in through a lot of garages because um, at their front gates, organizations have loads of security. They've got turnstiles and stuff. But if their employees are driving in in the morning, they usually can't be bothered with that level of security. So I just walk in a lot that way. Um, you need to figure out if staff wear or show passes. Can you copy them? Uh, or are all the staff going to the same place for lunch, to the same coffee shop? Can you go there and mingle with the staff? Can you even find a lost property where you can grab a card or um, a pass? So based on all the information that you've gathered, you need to create your scenario. And different organizations will require different levels of scenarios. So more security focused organizations, like for example, a lot of the financial organizations in London are quite security focused. They require a more complex attack. But a lot of the time, as I mentioned, you still can tailgate your way in, carrying a couple of cups of coffee or, heavy, or a box or a couple of heavy bags. You need to make your um, scenario look believable. So like the diamond heist, that might include wearing costumes, security jackets, hard hats, etc. More of that in a second. Um, and you can use props as well, mobile phones. I've walked past so many people. You know, if I'm social engineer in an organization and people start looking at me suspiciously, the first thing I do is take out a mobile phone and start talking because People won't really interrupt you if you're in the middle of a conversation. Uh, when I first started doing that, I'd just take out my phone and start talking without actually ringing anyone. Just remember, if you're doing that, put your phone on silent because it's really awkward if you're talking and your phone rings. Really awkward. Now I like to have a stooge back at the office that I can call and they know I'm going to ring up and talk randomly at them. And they will just play along and keep me talking so it looks a bit more natural. So in 2009, uh, I spoke about this guy in Monroe, Washington, who had robbed a bank uh, using a very imaginative method. So what he'd done was he'd advertised on Craigslist for uh, maintenance workers to arrive. He asked them to gather the following Tuesday outside the Bank of America, wearing something like a blue shirt uh, a hard hat and safety goggles or something like that. So a dozen or so people arrived wearing this costume. This guy also arrived wearing the same costume and he proceeded to uh, rob the uh, armored guard that was collecting the money and he got away with $220,000 in cash. And you know, this guy was amazing. They, he got away, um, he ran off to the nearest creek and floated down it using the inner tube from a tire. <laughs> Amazing. Uh, so what happened to this guy? He spent six years in jail. So I guess he got out, what, four years ago or something? Gotta love America, the land of opportunity. He's now an author, speaker, and youth advocate. Wow, so from bank robber to this, and one of his most popular books, My Daddy is in Jail. <laughs> So some of the scenarios that I've used uh, on the phone are uh, internal IT support, freelance IT journalist, recruitment agent, etc., etc. Um, some of the sample scenarios I've used on site, employee, temp, delivery person, fire warden, cleaner security. As I said, do not impersonate real people or organizations. But the most important thing I've learned over 10 years is that you need to pick a pretext or a scenario that physically suits you. So, which of the following pretexts are most likely to work for me? I'm kind of short. I don't look like a hacker. Haha, <laughs> useful. Um, IT department. Could I use that? Do I look like I work for an IT department? Not really. I've tried this one and it's awkward. People come up and say, are you lost? I'm like, no, I'm, I'm just owning your systems, thank you. <laughs> But I know it doesn't sit naturally with what they expect an IT department uh, and their IT staff to look like, so I don't play that one so much. Teacher? Mm, maybe. Yeah, yeah, I've done teacher once or twice. That's worked quite well, you know. Uh, I think the scenario I used, it was for um, a big venue, and I said, I'm interested in uh, bringing my school here. Can you give me a little tour? And they let me in. 
Telecoms engineer? No, but you know what? Most of my colleagues are guys and they put on yellow jackets and stuff and they really look the part, you know, for a telecoms engineer. I can't really do this one. <laughs> Likewise. <laughs> Cleaner. Yeah, totally. Yeah. You know, actually, even earlier this week, somebody said to me, you look like you work for Tesco's, a big supermarket chain in the UK. I mean, they could have picked Marks and Spencer or something a bit more high-end. I was really <laughs> insulted. <laughs> Pizza delivery. Um, waitress, catering, done that one. Yeah, it works quite well. Weightlifter. I am a weightlifter. <laughs> but I know I don't look it. Um, and to be honest, I have no idea how I can work this into a social engineering test. <laughs> Shoplifter, yeah. <laughs> Fire inspection officer. I tried this, yeah, I tried this once. Um, the problem here was I went in pretending to be from a council in London and, you know, I, I told them I was doing a spot check of their fire safety equipment and that was all very well and fine, but afterwards they tried to contact the council I said I was from to say, oh, here's the documents Sharon was requesting. Um, and that was one of my early social engineers when I realized you can't just play anybody that you want, you know. In an ethical test, it mostly has to be a fictional organization or individual that you are playing, unfortunately. Writer? I've written a book, thanks. Um, I did this one earlier this year, and it was really fun. So I said I was researching this particular individual, and I had to look for his records. So I did get into this organization, but you know what, fair play to them. Uh, the lady showed me his records, who showed me in, and um, she sat with me for two hours as I pretended to be in this guy. I mean, I practically had to write a book for my backstory. I could write a book about this guy as it is. Um, so it wasn't successful. I did get into the organization another way, though. CEO? Yeah. I know, yeah, exactly. So you do, you play to stereotypes. Much as I hate it, you do play to stereotypes. Um, I did this one once. I mean, this is playing the role of a CEO uh, over a phishing attack, fair enough, but in person is pretty brazen. So I was asked to open a sales conference for uh, a pharmaceutical company pretending to be the newly appointed CEO, and it was awesome, because I got in in the morning and my role was just to mingle with staff and talk to them. And then the conference started, and they had big disco lights. It was really flashy, a really flashy sales conference. And I walked up to the podium, and you could see people going, oh my God, that's the new CEO, and we've just been laughing and joking and saying things we shouldn't. They were really embarrassed, and then I went on to explain, you know, I'm not even the new CEO, I'm a social engineer, and they were doubly embarrassed. I, uh, <laughs> from a malicious social engineering point of view, I don't think that's much of a threat, but I tell you what, as a security awareness raising exercise, it was absolutely fantastic in getting people to understand that uh, people aren't always who they say they are. So you've come up with your scenario or your pretext, you need to go in for the attack. Use your scenario to get in. You may need to get access to the network. You're somehow going to have to prove you were there, either by gathering trophies um, over the years. I suppose different trophies I've gathered could be things like uh, help desk tickets. I had to go for lunch in one organization, that was all I had to do. In others, I had to send emails from various accounts, etc. Or you can leave a token, take lots of photos, make some internal phone calls. Um, you know, one of the things I like to do is try and find the office of the person who's commissioned the test and make myself known to them. But, you know, a lot of the time that's just a real pain in the ass thing to do, what social engineers are a pain in the ass. But you need to have an exit strategy. Sometimes you can get into an organization, but it's kind of hard to get out again. Uh, I remember in one of my earlier tests, I'd got in, I was really thrilled with myself, I got into an organization, and I couldn't get out again because there were turnstiles, and I'd sneaked in, and I was really stuck. So I knew, I, I got into the lift, and there was a bunch of people going down in the lift, and I thought, this is my only chance, I have to get out with them because they'll open the side gate for them. There's loads of them, so I can sneak out with them. So I had to make conversation with them. <laughs> and all I could think of to say was, 
is this lift going up or down? <laughs> so you need to be able to just talk to people and have it at the tip of your tongue. Oh my goodness. So much better at talking to people now. <laughs> um, Back in 2009, the Times in the UK had just published the top 10 real-life spy gadgets. Uh, and you know what? If I think about all the spy equipment and the social engineering tools that I have now, a decade ago, well, there were very, very few software tools uh, to start with. Now there's a lot more software tools available for social engineers to help with your OSINT, your reconnaissance, etc. Um, but there's also an awful lot more hardware available now. So I. Ten years ago, I used to use a handbag for my social engineer, and it was a spy handbag. I thought it was the business. It had a hidden camera in it, microphones, etc. And I used to, you know, shoulder surf people so I could see them uh, typing in their passwords, etc., or just recording uh, what I was doing for evidence that I had been in there. And I remember buying that. I had to go to a speciality spy shop in Mayfair, and it cost a thousand pounds. Now this equipment, you can make yourself, or you can buy it online for next to nothing, even the high-end stuff. And one of the best things about being a social engineer for work is you can buy James Bond equipment and charge it up to your company. So, <laughs> so once you've done your social engineering test, you need to uh, write your report. And after all the adrenaline and all the fun you've had, the report can be really dull to write. Um, but it pretty much reads like a pen test report. You, you explain what you've done, uh, the methods used, you, you draw out your vulnerabilities, your recommendations. Photos and videos are always great fun to include, and generally um, clients are really keen on them. I used to say don't name individuals, and I don't make a practice of naming individuals in my social engineering reports, but a lot of the time it's very easy to figure out who they were, you know, uh, not much I can do about that. So my tips from 2009, use a false name but use your own first name, I stand by that because uh, you want to actually respond when people talk to you. And for the same reason, I use a surname generally that sounds quite like my own. Uh, I did say be a woman, preferably a foreign one, but actually I take that back because all the guys I know are just as successful as I am at social engineering. Uh, if it's a remote test, you can pretend to be whoever you want to be anyway. It doesn't make a difference. Flirt, use flattery, offer an incentive. If all else fails, get a job within the organization. I've been for dozens of interviews in organizations that I'm looking to social engineer. And that comes with the benefit that you are an unknown to the organization, but they are letting you into their premises. So it's really, really useful. What can go wrong in your social engineering tests? You can be recognized. Um, it's happened to me. Well, well, once I thought I was recognized, but I wasn't I was an, an Irish guy. I think I referred to it in my first BrewCon, actually. I got into an organization, and um, at the time I was playing the role of a graduate, and I was targeting a graduate who worked for that organization, and he got his Irish friend to come and meet me, and I thought, oh, why do I know you? I was really worried that this guy had recognized me. Um, I've worked for big organizations since where I've known staff in them, and it's been kind of awkward. Uh, it may be that you've played the wrong role, so it hasn't worked out too successfully for you. Depending on your budget, you can go back in and try again anyway. Um, I've worked with a lot of other people over the past decade trying to help me with social engineering tests. And, you know, social engineering seems quite straightforward, but I have learned that not everyone can do it. Uh, most people don't have the cajones, I suppose, to do it. Um, people aren't always comfortable lying to other people. And I get that, and that's what makes for a nice society, really. But when they try to lie or go into their social engineering, a lot of the time, rookies overcompensate by giving too much detail, and it makes it sound very false. And of course, there's a lot of laws that you might break. So you really, really need to be prepared. Any of my social engineering tests are like 90% preparation and 10% execution. Then another 100% right in the report, if we think about it. So how do you prevent social engineering attacks? Well, here I am 10 years later and no closer to the answer. I guess it's some combination of people, process, and technology, but I haven't really found any organizations that have found the answer to this yet. Education and awareness, social engineering testing, uh, security policy and vetting your staff. 
you know, are, are all key to it, but each of them on their own or as a one-off won't be effective. So above all, don't trust anyone, and especially don't trust me. <laughs> I think I have time for one or two questions. Uh, if anyone has any questions. <laughs> Thank you. Yep. Sorry? There. Um, so that you respond if people use your name. I think, you know, it's less relevant for... So the question was, why use a surname similar to your own name? Um, for a remote test, I guess it doesn't matter so much, but for a physical test when you're there in person, you're running on adrenaline and you want things to be as simple as possible. So if someone says your name, you don't know if they're going to call you Sharon or Mr. or Mrs. Conhedi. Um, so I just try and use my own first name for sure and then a surname that sounds a bit like mine, so I'm more likely to remember to respond when they say my name. Okay, thanks everyone. I hope oh, you enjoyed the second. rest of the conference. Oh, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> sorry. Um, for some of the work you do, you, don't you also don't need like a, like a license of a private investigator for legal reasons? I sure hope not. <laughs> <laughs> But you know what, um, a lot of the time, uh, once I come up with my scenario, I might come up with 12 scenarios um, to try and get into an organization. And I discount easily half of them. And then I bring the remainder to the HR department more and more recently, actually, um, so that they can approve which ones I use or do not use. So on the end of the day, I can say, well, this one was run past your HR to make sure it's OK. I think if you're going into that level of social engineering, you know, is it ethical or unethical? That gets really tricky. But don't go there. Yeah. How many attempts do I need to get into an organization? Uh, it really varies from organization to organization. I mean, um, sometimes you get lucky, you get in on your first attempt. Sometimes you've spent weeks or months creating a scenario and you just tailgate your way in. And you think, what did I spend all that time doing that for? But you always have to have your backstory so you feel more confident once you're in there. So, I mean, it depends how much budget you have, really. So I've got into an organization, and then I've used different techniques to try and get in again. And once you've got in once, you get really cheeky trying different things as well. You try really silly stuff. It sometimes it works. Yeah. Cut that. Yeah. So, uh, do you check the culture of the organization? For example, might it be more difficult to get into a foreign organization like a Polish organization for me? Yeah, um, potentially, but that's when, for example, my mumble attack comes in useful. I mean, if, if uh, I'm targeting an organization in Poland, I will do it if there's some reason they should have an English speaker there, visiting from maybe an international office or something. But if not, well, then I'll get somebody who's Polish to do it. There's no point. You know, you want to blend in, so there's no point me doing something like that. Yeah. After <laughs> <laughs> Sorry? No. Yeah, great, okay, yeah. But I mean, by and large, I just play up to stereotypes and people who should normally look like they're within an organization. So I have, I have done stuff abroad um, where I feel it's appropriate. Yeah. Um, yes, I use a fake CV. I try and make it as realistic as possible. So I spent, uh, you know, I, I um, spent six or seven years working for big four organizations, EY and Deloitte, and that gets you in. You know, you can pretend to have done any role in there, and they can't check, and I have spent time there, so that's been useful. <laughs> yeah. 
yeah, I reckon people try to social engineer me all the time. It's, it's very hard to detect and I'm as much at risk of being social engineered as anyone else and to, to think otherwise would be unrealistic. Yeah. Have I been caught and how did I handle it? <laughs> um, I haven't been caught too much. <laughs> Uh, a lot of the time, if something doesn't work, it's not registered as a social engineering attempt anyway. You know, if you can't, can't tailgate, you walk away. If something doesn't work, you just try something else. So it's not like they've gone, oh, red flag, there's a social engineer there. You can just go and try something else. Um, I have been caught as a social engineer, I, sp I suppose, a couple of times. Once I was caught, I was getting into an organization and they had informed their staff that a physical social engineering test would take place, which I advise against because then people are even more, well, they're more on guard than they usually are and it doesn't give a realistic view of if a malicious social engineering attempt would be successful or not. So I try and say, you know, just have your usual levels of security. So in this case, they'd been warned so every visitor that arrived to the organization uh, went to a little room with security to get questioned. <laughs> so I arrived with my pretext and they took me into this little room and they said, look, we're really, really sorry about this, but we're having something happen at the moment called social engineering tests. And I said, what? What's that then? <laughs> they said, I know. So these people are testing our, their, our security. And I said, what? People do that for a living? Awesome. <laughs> and they said, yeah, I know. Go on through. <laughs> Um, and another time I remember back in the days when I used to take a laptop in with me, you know, now you leave a device in there that phones home, it's a lot quicker. But I used to bring a laptop in with me and try to connect to the network. And I remember being in a, a press room that uh, wasn't in use because there was no events happening. But when an event happened, uh, this was really busy. They had uh, good network connections in there, which was what I was most concerned about. And I was literally hiding under a desk. The room was empty. And I was hiding under a desk like this with my laptop, with the lights off, so that no one would come in and be suspicious. But a security guard came in. I was like, oh my god, what did I do? And there was a box of Pringles underneath the desk. And I took the box of Pringles. I said, hey, would you like a Pringle? And the security guard said, oh yeah, and just started chatting to me and then walked off. <laughs> yeah, so maybe you always bring Pringles with you. <laughs> okay, I think I'm just about out of time, but thanks very much for having me back.